halfway up a steep mountainside in the South American Andes, along one of the many terraformed and terraced sections of Peru's Sacred Valley, there is an ancient and man-made cave. This is not the product of any Stone Age or primitive culture. This cave is a mystery, and it's a contradiction in our understanding of history. What is clear is that at some point long ago, it was hewn directly into a bluestone granite outcropping of the mountainside itself, and its monolithic walls and its sculptures reflect some astonishingly precise and difficult stonework. Stonework that's of a quality that matches any megalithic structure or object on the planet. The level of technology that is reflected in the construction of this stonework cannot be reasonably attributed to what we know of the Inca, who are the people and civilization credited with manufacturing this cave. This is the mystery because we also cannot attribute it to any of the other known civilizations or cultures that have inhabited this region prior to or after the Inca, at least up until our modern age with our machinery and high technology. Now this statement really isn't saying much as prior to the Inca, we barely have any real information at all about the true history of this region. Whatever we might have gleaned about the past from them was mostly all destroyed by the invading Spanish, who seemed to have been on something of a divine treasure hunt and they were most definitely not looking for second opinions about the meaning of architecture, beyond wondering if it's all just some sort of elaborate pinata with gold hidden away on the inside. For those willing to make the trek and to visit this remote spot, for those willing to examine this cave, not just with eyes, but also with an open mind, it offers a tantalizing glimpse into a lost era of history and clues to the advanced megalithic capabilities of what must have been a mighty civilization. One that demonstrated an unsurpassed mastery over natural materials like stone, and one whose members must have walked in this very place millennia ago, and a civilization that was ultimately lost to cataclysm and to the sands of time. My name is Ben, and you're watching Uncharted X. This cave is known as Napa Huaca, or Napa Inglesia, and I want to use it as the canvas to explore some of the inconsistencies and mysteries that surrounds the roots of civilization in this part of South America. These mysteries stand in stark contradiction to the orthodox story of history, yet they're rarely ever acknowledged at all by mainstream academia, whose position on most all of the sites in the Sacred Valley region can be roughly summarized as the Inca did it. This assertion is highly questionable for several good reasons, not the least of which is the super obviously different types of masonry work on these, these supposedly built from scratch Inca sites. This is evident on some of these sites, in particular the ones that include the just massively solid and precise megalithic work, the work that this region is really famous for. This work is always in the central core of construction. It's in the deepest and oldest layers of these sites. And this is often accompanied by architecture of an entirely different nature, a layer of primitive loose dry stone or mud mortared walls and masonry. And this layer always seems to be on top of the more sophisticated megalithic work. Despite these obvious differences, both styles are supposedly all made by the same civilization and done in the same time period. So if you're looking for a bit more detail on those statements, I'd recommend checking out my video on why I think the Andean architecture is so much older than the Inca. I'll provide a link to it below. If you haven't seen it, it's probably worth watching before watching the rest of this video. It's like a 101 or an intro for how to look at these sites. It gets into the traditional timeline for this region and the technical details of the different architecture styles you're likely to see in Peru. This cave is located in one of the valleys off the main axis of the Sacred Valley, and it's relatively close to Alante Tambo. It isn't a spot that's visited by tourists very often, and it's something of an adventure just to get there. There isn't the typical infrastructure you'll find in many of these other spots. There's no parking lots, no vendors. It's just a remote dirt road and some very narrow bridges that you have to go through in order to get into this valley. So once you're there, you then have to hike up a railway track in the valley floor next to a river and ascend up a few hundred stairs of Inca terracing and then cut across the mountainside to eventually gain access to the cave. Carved into the walls and floor of this cave, which is to say carved from the same monolithic rock of the mountain itself, are some incredible examples of ancient craftsmanship and precision engineering. Examples that are very hard to explain when viewed through the orthodox lens of history. There are two main features in this cave that are worth examining, and then there's the cave itself. 
The location for this cave seems like a very deliberate choice, as this is the only outcropping of bluestone anywhere on the surrounding mountainsides, which are all formed of sandstone, and quite clearly of a contrastingly different colour to this outcropping of bluestone. This is a form of granite, and as with other forms of granite, it has a high quartz content in the stone structure itself. It has piezoelectric properties, and this stone is reported as being magnetic as well. It also shares some characteristics with other megalithic sites. For example, bluestone is a type of stone that's used in some of the earliest parts of Stonehenge. The cave itself likely once extended much further back into the mountain, but whether there is anything back there other than some bats really remains a mystery, as it appears to have been subjected to several cave-ins over the years. I did try to get back in there as far as I could uh, when I was there. There is a huge carving on the right-hand side wall of the cave as you're looking at it, and it's of what really can only be described as a portal or an indentation into the wall itself. This shows some astonishingly flat surfaces that have been carved directly into the granite. There are precision angles and square corners in the rock itself, and for some reason when I look at it, it makes me think of something like a giant power plug, and uh, I don't know why. This is really no easy or primitive achievement. As with other examples of precision work that is wrought into very hard stone, examples like the insides of the boxes in the Serapium of Saqqara in Egypt, the craftsmen that did this required specific tools and techniques in order to achieve this outcome. And these tools and techniques cannot be logically attributed to what we know of the Inca. Freddie Silva at the website ancientorigins.net has written a very interesting article on Napahuaca. And in this article he explains that none of this work in this cave is random and it happens to share some very interesting attributes with other megalithic constructions found on the other side of the world. To quote directly from the website, quote, the measurements of the main portal of Napahuaca are not random. They conform to musical notation. The length to height ratio is 3 to 1 making a perfect fifth in the second octave. The ratio of the alcove is five to six, which is a minor third. The five to six ratio is both unusual and filled with specialist information. It perfectly describes the movement of the earth, whose pole completes one full rotation of its axis every 25,920 years, while the plane of the equator tilts four degrees every 21,000 years, a ratio of five to six. This accurate calculation of the motion of the planet is also encoded in another unusual temple, the Bent Pyramid of Egypt, whose slope angles encode the same ratio. Dominating the unique environment of Napahuaca is the cave ceiling. It has been expertly sliced like butter, bear in mind that we are at an altitude of 9800 feet on the side of a ravine, and smoothed with laser-like precision to create two different yet specific angles, 60 degrees and 52 degrees. There is only one other place on Earth where these two numbers appear side by side, the slope angles of the two major pyramids at Giza." End quote. The masonry only gets more complex when examining the partially destroyed sculpture that sits at the cave's entrance, and this has also been carved directly from the monolithic living rock of the mountain itself. There are some incredibly fine details here, straight lines and precise angles, as well as very smooth and flat finished surfaces. Unfortunately, this breathtaking sculpture was suspiciously intact when the Spanish rolled through this region, and they thoroughly investigated it for hidden treasure by smashing it to pieces, as they did to much of the megalithic work in Peru. I can only imagine the majesty of this piece when it was whole, and it turns out that busting up granite is hard work, so thankfully some parts of this artwork are still left to tease us. The great civilization of the Inca that was centered in the megalithic city of Cusco undoubtedly both knew of this place and they used it. The evidence of the Inca civilization is everywhere. Their prolific terracing and staircases are found all around this area. Also on these sites and across many hundreds of acres of the Andes, the Inca have literally terraformed steep mountainsides into an endless series of flat terraces and retaining walls. This type of construction is very much in line with what we know of the technological capability of the Inca, who possessed some bronze and copper, perhaps even some meteoric iron. But they used mostly stone for their tools and weaponry, and obsidian was commonly used in place of metal blades. There are of course some exceptions to this, but metal was mostly used ceremonially or decoratively. The Inca were extremely talented artisans and craftsmen, but relatively primitive in their techniques and their capabilities nonetheless. 
Executing precision megalithic work of this nature, either into granite hillsides or carving the 70 ton blocks like those we see at Alante Tambo, this work requires a high degree of precision, which in turn requires a high degree of technology, which realistically the Inca just did not seem to possess. So with these points in mind, and considering the murky and unknown nature of much of South American history, what do you think is more likely? Did the Inca create this cave and make these carvings into the granite, or did they inherit it and then use the site, adopt it into their culture? Here's Brian Forrester, with whom I first visited this cave in 2013. Brian is doing really important work, I think, on his YouTube channel. He shares great footage and insight from so many ancient sites around the world and so many places that people just haven't seen before. He's authored several books on the topic. He lives in Peru. He has visited all of these sites down here many, many times, and his guided trips are really the experience of a lifetime. I'd highly recommend them to anyone. He's someone who I consider a friend, and since I first traveled with him in 2013, I've had the chance to both talk with and interview Brian several times. And this footage is from an interview that my buddy Luke and I did with him when we were in Cusco in 2015. The Inca's role was to build buildings um, out of what was available. So they recycled some of the damaged structures from uh, the early megalithic builders. What's intriguing about the Inca is that they appear to have been incredibly respectful of whoever it was that first built Cusco. They, would, they seemingly would never touch any of the, of the surfaces and remove something. But if something was on the ground, it's like, well, we don't know where that goes, so let's use it to build something around it or to enhance what's already been here. Oyente Tambo, Machu Picchu, Saxe Waman being very classic examples of that. When you visit this cave, it's quite clear that it is a sacred and likely vastly ancient place. You can just feel it in your bones. There is some proof here that the Inca also felt the same sense of awe and reverence that it inspires in many of the visitors who come here in our own modern age, as it certainly inspires in me. The Inca greatly respected the abilities of their distant ancestors, this ancient and lost megalithic builder culture. At Napahuaca itself, offerings were made and homage was paid by the Inca, and this homage took the form of respectful imitation through their primitive mud brick and loosely mortared rock architecture that has been erected opposite to the incredibly precision carved and clinically flat surfaces of the ancient portal carved directly into the granite. Here's another example of respectful homage being paid in the Silastani towers that lie near Lake Titicaca. Note the reuse of the megalithic stone in the more primitive of the towers and the efforts to repair the other megalithic work. This is a common thing to see such reuse of megalithic stone and even the colonial Spanish repaired and rebuilt using the megalithic masonry that was laying around. After all, the megalithic work is of a very high quality as well as being usually made from very hard stone that's been shipped in from a distant quarry. But the megalithic builders would go as far as was required, which is, is a, a similar thing we find in Egypt. Um, they had to have stone that either had a high crist uh, quartz crystal content or iron content. So the basalt, um, which is what this is, possibly, comes from a, one quarry 50 kilometers in that direction. And um, then there's the limestone, which sucks at Waman, which is right here. And its quarry is about 10 to 15 kilometers in that direction. Um, and there are other quarries too, uh, of great distance. And the, the important thing for the megalithic builders was any structure could only be constructed out of stone from one quarry. They, they never mixed the stone. It all had to be the same quality because of the characteristics that they were after, which is almost science fiction. This isn't the gap between master and apprentice that closes over a lifetime. This is a technological gap that represents two fundamentally different levels of capability. This small cave contains perhaps one of the very best examples anywhere in Peru that there were at least two civilizations at work here, perhaps more, and that the older civilization was far more advanced in technological capability than the Inca, to whom all of this work is attributed in mainstream history. Really good evidence that Cusco existed before was the fact that the Inca a thousand years ago were kicked out of Lake Titicaca by the Aymara people. And so rather than dispersing, they went, they knew that they would um, find a place to resettle. And they followed a road that existed north. And um, 
when they got to within one hour's drive of Cusco, there is a big wall with a, a gate in it. That's called the Intipunku, and that is megalithic. When they found that, I think that's when they decided, rather than follow the Inca Trail into the sacred valley, because they were following the sacred river from Lake Titicaca this way, by normal nature they would have followed the river down into the sacred valley, but instead they encountered this gate, and I'm sure they said, what's beyond the gate? And uh, as they followed the gate, they encountered megalithic structures. By the time they reached Cusco itself, they found an abandoned city that was megalithic. And so blown away by this fact that I'm sure they said, maybe, this was the city of the gods. This is where we're going to build our new capital. And so the Cori Cancha existed at that time. And because of its energetic nature, uh, I and profound construction, I believe that Manco Capac simply said, this is too profound for me to live in. I get first choice of all of the other megalithic structures. And so he looked up on the hill, which is exactly where we are, and he found uh, what is called San Cristobel, or San Cristobal, and he said, rebuild this megalithic ruin and make it my palace. And a policy of the Inca was that each of the 12 Inca in succession had what was called a panaca, and that means they chose who did what, like who was in charge of the military, who was in charge of the, the priesthood, etc., etc., and it had to be a member of the family. But when that high Inca died, the son who inherited the title of high Inca got to choose his own government and people, which is a very smart move. So what you had was the son of Manco Capac could not live where we are in, in Manco Capac's palace, so he had to uh, find another place to live. And so he would have one of the other megalithic courtyards rebuilt. By the time you get to the eighth high Inca, there were no more megalithic uh, ruins to be restored. So that's where we find that the 9th, the 10th, the 11th all had to build their structures from scratch. And what we see there is they're all made of little blocks or adobe. No megalithic work. So if the Inca were responsible for the megalithic work, it meant they had profound capability in the beginning and slid downhill for the next 500 years, which is not the case. They simply found an abandoned megalithic city and rebuilt it. One thing I've been wanting to talk about in my videos, and this is a slight departure from the usual analytical nature of my work, but this place is considered by the local traditions and the people who still give offerings here today really as a sacred place amongst other sacred places. Many people talk about the palpable energy on this site. On Brian's channel, he has a video called Peru's Cave of Dangerous Energies. And in that video, he has a discussion with Teo Paredes, a Cusco-based researcher and PhD anthropologist. And this discussion is not only insightful, but a just beautifully poetic description of what it's like to visit this place. I'm generally always focused on the architecture and considering the practical realities when I'm visiting megalithic sites, but I really do admit to feeling a sense of sacred awe in this cave. It does give you goosebumps when you go there. And this is an interesting phenomenon because I've also noticed this feeling in ancient Egyptian sites and in some other locations around the world. This isn't just me that feels this either. Many self-described left brain people or those who are generally more analytical or logical in their nature, they admit to being struck by this. Chris Dunn remarked on it after his first trip to Egypt and he's about as analytical as you can get. You don't really expect this feeling going into it, but you just can't help but feel something when you visit these places. Call it a connection or some deep sense of reverence. I really wasn't expecting the emotional or the right brain connection that unconsciously just happens at places like Napahuaca or inside the Great Pyramid at Giza. Perhaps it comes simply from being in the presence of such magnificent and mysterious achievements, but I don't think you need to have studied these sites in detail to just instinctively grasp that these are seriously special places. I think if you're just open to them, you can't help but feel that. And it's very right, you know, they're very right-brained approach that these people or whatever they were were doing, and that's why it's hard to nail into somebody's head who is of European background because we're more left-brained. But um, I think indigenous people are more, you know, could catch the organic aspect more. But um, that's, the, that's what's difficult to, to get people to understand. 
um, is that some of this work we can't do to this very day. It's beyond us. And 99.9% .9 of, of people will not accept that because we're the highest level of evolution. Yeah, it's, a, it's an arrogant kind of terrible. thought, isn't it? It's terrible, yeah. There is a great deal of symbology and meaning to these sites in Inca traditions and mythology, many of which have persisted down through centuries and are kept alive by their modern-day descendants, who still make offerings and conduct ceremony in many of these sites. If you ever visit Peru, you will often hear talk of the Chicana, and you'll see its characteristic shape and how it represents the three levels of the universe, with each level's corresponding symbolic and sacred animal avatars also represented in the landscapes and in the architecture. The Inca were deeply connected to their environment and to the elements of nature. When I was there in 2013 with Brian Forrester and Graham Hancock, we had with us an excellent local guide named Rogelio and a shaman named Wilco that also accompanied us. And I believe Wilco still accompanies Brian on all of his tours. Here is Rogelio explaining the Chicana culture at Alante Tambo. And here, we don't know exactly what the Incas, what these people, what these ancient people want to make here. So the point here is that you can see this symbol again. Yeah? Look at here. One, two, three. Did you see the three one? So the same philosophy that the Incas used that. The three levels of the world. Yeah? Ucupacha, Kaipacha, Hanampacha. So the mother earth uh, level or under the ground. The second level is where we are live now, the present world. The other one is the celestial world, which is in the sky. So all these three levels were symbolized for three animals, snake, puma, and condor. What we represent? Pumas. We are the second level here. So that's why in the next stone you can see kind of profiles of the bodies of pumas. Just probably the Spanish they carry the heads, the head parts. But you can see clearly the tail part, all the body almost disappearing here. Look at the tail, look at the body, but the head was carried. We don't know exactly who made that. But the point is that this temple, it wasn't finished. Why? Because when you go to the quarry sector, there is more stones waiting for these ancient people. We don't know exactly why they stopped this work. So most of the theories mention that probably if the Incas built that, so when the Spanish came in 15 centuries, so they have to stop this work. But probably it's more ancient. Yeah? More ancient. So Chicana literally means to bridge or to cross. And this concept of three levels of existence that are connected somehow is not something that is just unique to the Inca. It's a concept that's shared culturally across many great ancient civilizations, including the Native Americans of southwestern United States, the ancient Persian religions, as well as, of course, the ancient Egyptians. As anybody who's studied them will know, they also talked about three levels of existence with the Duat, the common world, and the underworld. One has to wonder, is this yet another remnant, a common element that has been inherited by all these cultures from some distant, ancient and common ancestor culture? In my mind, you do need a slight pinch of salt to see the symbolic nature of the ancient work here. You kind of have to be looking for the shapes in order to recognize them. Maybe a pinch or two of DMT snuff or ayahuasca probably helped the process along greatly, I'd imagine. And the Inca saw shapes not only in the architecture, but also in the landscapes and mountains themselves. I think it's a way of connecting their spirituality directly with the reality of the world around them. It's absolutely an aspect of the history of this region that is worth consideration. I intend to keep this perspective in mind as I investigate the many sites that I visited and filmed at in Peru and Bolivia. Matt from Ancient Architects as well as Brian Forrester have some great videos looking into these aspects of the megalithic construction. Again, here's Rogelio explaining how the Inca interpreted this site and the architecture at Napahuaca. Now, also, I have a shape here. Look at, that is the eye. It's actually a big puma head, yeah? Eye. That's little, here corners, always three. That was part of the ear part. But it's missing, of course, you can see clearly. Yeah, I 
That means the mouth of Puma. What well, is exactly the connection? And these two protuberance here means connection, and that's the teeth of Puma. Yeah? And that's probably a doorway also here. But that's in the local philosophy is called Chacana, you know? The three levels of the world. So everywhere you will find, look at three corners. Three corners. The number three, it was not only ink, it was more oldest. Yeah? About this window, it's another doorway. So in so many places, like at Puno, you will find kind of these doors. It was like a doorway as well. Probably they can make connections between that and temples. Of course, this is not the real level of that. Most of this soil where you were standing up so came from this hole. Also, it was a nice ornamental place. It was. The people who climbed you saw really clearly some windows there, still on one side. So making excavation, probably we can find more evidence, more important things just here. So coming at night, I came so many times at night, you can feel energy running around here. Almost if you come by yourself, you can just uh, can be scary, yeah? Really, really strong energy here. Also, when you are only you here, you can feel energy. Now, it's so impossible because we are a big group. But also, look at Yeah? He's pointing to Cusco also here. Cusco is in the south part. So all this mountain, so I see a face in front. When you see the big hole uh -huh. in front, that is one of the eye. Yeah? The right eye. <coughs> the left side is more, almost disappearing. The mud fly is almost covering, and you can see the big nose checking us. Look at it. Check it here. The idea that these megalithic sites were constructed by an unknown party and are possibly far older than the Inca themselves, who likely then inherited and restored them, much as our own modern civilization restores their work today, this should at least be a consideration for mainstream historians. The murky nature of South American history alone prevents one from ruling out this possibility. For example, there's a site near Lima in Peru called Corral, where some culture was building pyramids around 5,000 years ago, at least 4,000 years before the Inca ever even showed up in the highlands. Much new evidence in recent years is showing a human presence in the Americas far, far further back in time than we had previously thought, as well as DNA linkages between South America and Australasia that suggest a much more complex past than our own current story of history allows for. Not only that, but the effects of the Younger Dryas Cataclysm in South America are now well known. I fairly recently spent about an hour talking about it on a podcast. I reviewed the latest peer-reviewed paper from the Comet Research Group that was published in Nature. Now, this video is worth a watch if you're looking for the evidence behind these statements. But in summary, the Younger Dryas Cataclysm in this region was utterly devastating. I've heard Randall Carlson describe the Younger Dryas Cosmic Impact as the biggest thing to hit the planet in the last 5 million years. Now this cataclysm, this cosmic impact, this destruction, this occurred around 12,800 years ago. And in South America, evidence suggests that around 80% of all large mammals were suddenly made extinct. The climate dramatically changed and plant life overall decreased by tenfolds for a decade, while 10% of the biomass on the planet burned. The sea levels rose dramatically and this was all just secondary fallout from what was most likely a tremendous series of cosmic impacts and air bursts that ploughed into the northern hemisphere around the end of the Pleistocene era. So let's do a little bit of a thought exercise here, just for the sake of argument. Let's assume that there was a megalithic builder culture in existence in this region at some point in the 300,000 year period that modern humans are known to have been around on the planet. But let's simplify things a little bit and say that this megalithic culture lived somewhere in the 50,000 to 13,000 years ago time frame. And they were living on the planet at the same time as did the known Neolithic hunter-gatherer cultures. This itself, this idea of two cultures living side by side and perhaps not even knowing of each other isn't a strange or unplausible idea at all. The world is a pretty big place after all and there really weren't that many of us back then. 
We didn't get to the whole breeding like frenzied rabbits thing until really the last couple of centuries. And even with the, what are we at now, 110 billion or something people on the planet, this sort of unknown cohabitation between what is essentially civilization and not civilization is still occurring in some parts of the world. And every time we fly a helicopter or some light aircraft near these uncontacted tribes, it always makes me giggle just a little bit to think about what they're saying. You've got to imagine it's something on the lines of, Hey Terry, what's this noisy demon up there in the sky? Oh dear, kill it, kill it, kill it. Uh, and there come the arrows. So let's assume that these megalithic cities existed, these sites existed, and they were population centers. People were likely specialized, they were civilized, much like today, and they had evolved to rely on each other and a degree of infrastructure, and this likely happened over generations. Individuals likely didn't have innate survival skills, also very much like today, which is really only something you need to worry about should the proverbial poop hit the megalithic ceiling fan which it most certainly did in the form of the Younger Dryas. The mythical doom and destruction that is wrought into so many of our religions and myths actually came calling some 12,800 years ago. The impact, liquefaction, the giant global tsunamis, the fact that huge parts of the world were subject to just unimaginable flooding or fire, this was just the primary impact. And if you somehow managed to dodge those, like you're The Rock and this is another disaster porn movie, it really only just got worse from there. It was an actual nuclear winter that engulfed the planet. The sun was gone for many years. There was an intense and unending months or even years of rainout periods. There was a thousand year global deep freeze. There was the complete upheaval of climate and ecosystems. The majority of plant and animal life on the planets was dead or dying. And this probably took place over generations of time. Not to mention the tremendous and rapid rise of sea levels around the world, which permanently drowned some 10 million square miles of land around the continental shelves. How do you think the large Homo sapien mammals that were walking around in that nice civilization would have fared, trying to survive the fallout from this cataclysm? How do you think we would do should it happen today? And what do you think would be left after such a cataclysm itself struck, and then give it 10 or 15,000 years of time? I don't think there would be much left. Maybe the remnants of stonework in places that escaped the total destruction of the cataclysm itself, and then maybe the echoes of an advanced culture and civilization, some tiny flames of knowledge kept alight through indigenous traditions and oral storytelling, eventually blending into myth and legends of mystical times, of gods and of magic. Now, this is just a thought exercise. I can't claim any of this to be an impervious truth, really any more than the academics can declare it to be truth for our orthodox story of history. Both what I'm saying and what they say are just really the interpretation of an incomplete set of evidence. But assuming that all I just said was true, is it any wonder that we can't find sophisticated tools lying around that explain these objects and artifacts? They would be long gone to the sands of time, and that is only if they were even left there on the job site, so to speak, in the first place. Tools are expensive, after all. They're valuable. How many contractors do you know that leave all their gear behind when they do a job? What isn't a thought exercise, and what is impervious truth, however, is that the Younger Dryas Cataclysm happened. It happened whether you think it was a cosmic impact, a coronal mass ejection, a supernova, the electric universe theory, or anything else. It happened, and it was frankly pretty brutal to life on Earth, particularly to the big meatbag mammals like us who thought we were running the joint, and not just 20 points on a pinball table called the Cosmic Shooting Gallery. Insert another quarter in 50,000 years or so and have another shot. It likely took millennia for human populations to crawl back out from our hidey holes and recover to a point where we could even consider civilization again. And I think there's a good chance that this latest attempt at civilization, the one that's happened in the last 6,000 years or so and points directly to us sitting here right now in front of our computers, is what we call our orthodox version of history. The premise of a longer human timeline, of the rise and fall of lost civilization, of forms of high technology that have now been lost to us, of a growth that was interrupted and then reset by cataclysm, this premise certainly helps to explain the conundrums and contradictions of the evidence that confronts us in the masonry of so many ancient sites in Peru and elsewhere. Who should we really be consulting when it comes to the questions of architecture, of technical stone carving and engineering anyway? 
Is this an archaeological question for the people that study art, symbolic meaning and language? Or a technical question for the people who actually do such work, the engineers, the stonemasons, the construction experts, the people that know what it takes to achieve this? The problem that we have is people actually believe, like a Walt Disney film, that, um, that science is this open pursuit of, of knowledge. But when you find out that it's actually a little boy and girls club, where they protect each other. Uh, that's why it's important for you, <laughs> you guys, and me and others to, um, to expose the fact that we have been lied to about our history. And it's our birthright to know. What does that say about science? When... It says that science is not what we think it is. It's not this open pursuit of knowledge for the betterment of humanity. Number one is how do I pay my mortgage? How do I send my kids to school? So. No, so I, I quit science. I, I worked for the Canadian government after graduating for six months and then I quit because I was appalled at how unprofessional um, it is. And ever since then, I've, I've just seen case after case of, um, of people, scientists protecting and archaeologists protecting each other um, in order to not have their theories blown. But we have to rewrite history, it's the way it goes. That's the pursuit of humanity, advancement not protecting and hiding behind a door. How do you, uh, so how do you feel that, that that kind of mission is going? I mean, it's, it's been interesting in the last few years for me, I mean, personally, on that sort of a journey just for a few years now, and there's seen guys like your work, and there's more research, I mean, Graham's stuff, obviously, with the yeah. Comet and Randall Carlson. So do you think there's, I mean, are we at a tipping point? Do you think this? I mean, you encounter, must encounter so many people who come here with you to travel, and just, do you feel like people are waking up? Are they ready for this kind of a... A message. I mean, that's. Or is it? Is it? Is the evidence starting to swing in our favor? I mean, what are your thoughts there? No, oh, it's progress? a it's a landslide now. Standard Academia have lost it. They might as well all retire right now, <laughs> because I don't. You know, they can protect their jobs if they want to or whatever, but because we have technology which is affordable that we're using here, because we have the internet. It's too late. They, they can't, people can't cover stuff up anymore. We don't have to go in front of you to be peer-reviewed anymore because this information belongs to 7 billion people on this planet, not you. Right. Yeah, I can't ignore it anymore, right? No, they can't. Well, they, they can, but it, it doesn't, they don't matter anymore. You know, you don't have to go up to a PhD and say, am I allowed to do this? It's like, you have your world and we have the real world here that we're dealing with. everyone I hope you all enjoyed that I had some fun making this video if you think I should be doing more of what I'm doing please do consider supporting the channel through the value for value model you can find a ton of ways to do that over on unchartedx.com slash support it basically goes along the lines of although it's free content if you got some value from this please do consider giving me some of that value back in return I like to think of it as maybe worth the price of a cup of coffee maybe even a movie ticket you could also think of it as something like tipping a server, uh, that type of thing. It definitely helps me out. Uh, the more support I get, the more time I can put towards making these videos. So I've been thinking about the ends of these videos and I wanted to use them to shout out and give some thanks to some specific people, maybe even throw some bonus content in there. I know, right? Like not as if my videos were long enough already. So I just wanted to take a break from doing Egypt videos if for no other reason than to get like a palette shift away from the desert colors of Egypt. You just keep on looking at those same colors, it gets really tiring. So the idea of doing something that was green and sort of focused on Peru really uh, was appealing to me. And as I was getting into it, I sort of had a realization that I've got so much footage from all of these places and there are so many unexplored aspects to them that I really should be sharing them. I also got an email from one of my subscribers and my supporters, Frank, and this really uh, inspired me in part to make this video and to, to make this an actual series. And I just wanted to quote this email to you. It says, thanks for your reply, Ben. I don't have the opportunity to travel. I wish that I could, but I'm stuck in domestic agony, which that sucks, Frank. I'm really sorry to hear that. I want you to go to Pumapunku Tiwanaku and do an in-depth evaluation from your own perspective as you have done on so many other presentations. I'm going to boost your income via PayPal in the hope that I can help you to do so. Best regards, Frank. So Frank, thank you very much. I think I'd finished reading this. I looked up and I got a notification from PayPal and you dropped 250 bucks into my PayPal account, which is by far the biggest donation or contribution anyone's given me. So that really meant a lot. Like that was, it just, that inspires me to help make the videos. But I realized, 
that, you know, I've been to that to Pumapunku, to Tiwanaku. I spent four days there filming it over two separate occasions. I've got hours of footage from that place, but really very little of that footage has seen the light of day. So I'm absolutely going to do that evaluation and it's going to be one of the episodes in this series. I'm definitely going to look into things like geopolymers. Also wanted to thank all the other people that have reached out to me. I'm sorry if I haven't responded to everybody. I Typically the volume of my messages has gone through the roof lately. Uh, Hank, I'm talking to you uh, over on my website. You leave a lot of comments. I do read them. I'm sorry I don't get the chance to respond to every one of them. In any case, I will be getting back to Egypt. I've got a lot of videos on the drawing board and the whiteboard back here behind me. Uh, I will get to all of those topics. There's lots to explore further on this channel. So I will see all you guys in the next video. Peace. <laughs>